Good evening and welcome to the studio this evening and I still have this tendency to look over there at the, uh, the screen. Um, maybe I'll get one in front of me. Maybe I'll look at the preview on the screen in front of me. I could do with it. I suppose I'll have to figure out how to rearrange this. Screen. I've got a my drawing computer in front of me. It's a portable tablet computer and I'm using that. I was using it for remote control, but now I've got a fancy toy. I don't need that, but I am using that to see things like the chat. But I could do with being able to see an image as well. Either my preview image or what's coming out to you guys. But anyway, so what we're going to do, that's just a, a sort of comment. Just bear with me a second. Sorry about that. Um, possibility there of maybe Theo will come. I was just talking to Lady Zara there. She would like to get uh, the pussy cats in, which is a bit difficult on a night if they're out at about this sort of time because they basically don't want to come in. They want to be out and playing, and uh, it gets quite late sometimes when they come in. There. Right. And they like to keep them in overnight at the moment. Um, there are, for example, is a fox somewhere around in the vicinity. And I don't want the possibility of the pussycats um, deciding to see whether it will play. <laughs> God, I don't think it will. But anyway, so we're going to... I'm going to sneeze at some point, maybe. Um, and I was just thinking, maybe I'll finish off that picture sometime, which is the uh, magic dots. But we're going to do some more on this. I'm going to put some colour in on the face because it, the white is now starting to throw me in terms of shading and things like that. And I know this eye wants to be darker as well. So we're going to just carry on and do some basic, very pale shading for the, to start with. And then we'll be able to work on that shading to um, texture, not texture, to add to the the, key, the visual cues in that you look for when you're trying to work out the shape of things. And that's that, those sorts of visual cues are things like shadows and, and things like that, curvature of lines. Well, of course, with the pussycat and with the markings, curvature of lines you can't rely on the markings because they might be curved in an odd way anyway but they are still curved <laughs> it's a weird thing part of it is that it will be the fact that I know what it's supposed to look like with the markings you don't so um, what may look odd to me may look perfectly natural to you. So all I'm doing here is toning the bright, well effectively it's a bright white, it kind of looks bright white even though it actually isn't of course, of the bare wood. And just making that um, a non-white tone. That way um, it has less influence on the way in which looking at it affects your perception. Uh, they, in terms of monochrome image, the black and white or, or brown and white as it is here, the white well, the, the colour has a relationship to distance. Which means that you are picking up some of your visual cues as to the 3D-ness. 
and indeed the placement in 3D from the, the light and darkness of the colour that you're looking at. So white has a tendency, and obviously it's wood coloured rather than white, but white has a tendency to look really close to you. So it comes right to the forefront, which makes that uh, your brain look at things that are immediately next to it and go, well, if that white's at the, f you know, the extreme foreground, then the thing next to it has to be as well. And you're then trying to make sense of an image that kind of doesn't make sense because of that. Now the real odd thing is this, the amount of colouring I'm adding here is, is relatively minimal and yet it may, will make a significant difference to the perception of the image as it stands at the moment. Because it takes away that extreme white. Now obviously I say it's not white but your brain does tend to perceive it as extreme white even though it isn't. And again that's just uh, uh, your brain playing tricks on you. It kind of perceives it as white because the things next to it aren't. Sort of a, a weird sort of effect for how uh, you perceive colour, which changes according to lighting and, as I say, what's next to it. Being able to tell the colour in isolation in the one colour lighting can sometimes be very difficult, but two colours next to each other in that same lighting and you can tell them apart reasonably easily. Not tell them apart, tell what they are. Sort of a thing um, you might see if you have road lighting, which is sodium, that's the yellow, orangey light. Certain colours you will have difficulty uh, seeing at all, and other colours um, will look odd or look different. You won't tell what they are until you get a different colour next to it, colour car next to it, and you can tell both of them straight away. Quite a bit in the UK is changing up to using white lights. So don't necessarily necessarily see that effect very often these days. But it is a known effect. Police, for example, um, have some idea of uh, if you're looking under sodium light, then you say the colour of the car was. They know they may actually be looking for something different. I'm trying to think which colour of car it is now that looks black under sodium light but actually isn't black. But anyway. So as we put colour into this and you will see some of the colour, uh, the, the face shape is changing. And it's changing because you're now starting to see sort of the visual cues like the nose, it being white here, is showing as right at the front, which of course it is. So I've got some work to do under the chin here because that isn't right at the front, but at the moment that's, I won't say less of a priority, it's just I'm not doing it at the moment. So starting, well at the moment, this is just a colouring in exercise. A very smooth colouring in exercise. I need to make this sure this is as smooth as I can do it to start with at least. Don't want to impose colour variations just yet. I'll do that afterwards. And this is a really light colour. So I'll make it a little bit darker. There's no point in going well, I was going to say there's no point in going too light. I do want 
it light because I can make light darker. I can't do the opposite. But at this point in time I'm barely ironing the wood. I can see a colour change but I'm sure it's not showing up on camera. Interestingly last night I was again playing about with the problem of the audio of the microphone having difficulty with uh, clicking and pops which I know is coming from OBS and I did some was doing some research about it online to see if I could uh, resolve it I'd already been playing about with quite a lot of OBS settings and it weren't, wasn't going away. And I wasn't about to start um, playing about with USB leads again because again I know it's not the USB. Could still be the could still have been the controller. Or the controllers. And it may still be but uh, some of the research was actually suggesting it's this camera. When you're looking at through here, the Logitech C920, which is causing it, people using swapping that out for a different camera, for example, uh, found the problem went away. Some people reducing the resolution of the camera and um, caused it to go away. Some people changing the um, video encoding on the camera, make it go away. Or down to the camera or its um, driver on the operating system. Um, I haven't tried dropping the resolution on the camera, it's uh, it's running at full 1080p at the moment. I could run it at uh, 720 um, just because I'm broadcasting at 720p, so there's to some extent no point in it being at 1080 except it is interpolating then and. I was about to say, well, it would interpolate anyway. So now I'm letting OBS do the interpolation rather than the camera itself. As to which one's better, don't know, I haven't tried it. But what I have done is switch it to uh, force a particular motion MPEG, basically, a video format. And that immediately seemed to cure the sound problem last night. But there again, that's what happened the other night when I changed something else. And it didn't. Next time I started OBS up, it uh, had the same problem come back. So tonight, starting starting OBS up does seem to be the mic is uh, responding correctly. Once I've remembered to turn it on, actually, last night I got problems with on the PC with because I haven't turned it off, but the the audio assistant. Um, whatever she's called. Uh, I was watching Doctor Who and uh, at a couple of points in there um, whatever the sound was obviously it was being picked up by the microphone and was triggering the assistant. <laughs> so I had it physically turned off. There's a switch on the microphone to do that and uh, then I came to do the mic test at the start of this. Do a test recording and there's no audio. It's rather sort of muffled sort of sound coming out of it. And, oh, I've had broken something. And after a couple of tests, I still couldn't work out what it was that uh, was broken until I still remembered me turning the microphone off. And of course, switching it back on and it worked. I was half expecting to get the clicks and pops. And if there are any clicks and pops on the audio, yeah, please mention it in chat if you're watching, because that way well, there's not a lot I can do about it, I'm afraid, um, but at least I'll know that uh, I've not solved it. And I could then perhaps try dropping the resolution on the camera. Don't really want to buy a new one, apart from the fact of not being able to afford it at the moment. But uh, 
I don't want, yeah, I can't particularly afford it, which is one reason for not wanting to buy a camera, but uh, an extra another camera, but it's kind of like, I don't really, you know, just buying a camera just because it's got a different um, driver does seem a little bit over the top. Because what I actually might do, and it's something I keep meaning to do, so it's one of those to it jobs, is I should be able to use the Raspberry Pi with its uh, camera because that's a 1080p capable camera and so there's no particular reason why um, I shouldn't be able to use a Raspberry Pi or a Pi Zero for example with a video cam with its video camera on there and uh, use that to feed OBS and sell for what about 20 pound 25 pounds 30 pounds something like that a full 1080p capable camera wireless if I want it although I think you mind you're using the W or the, the the Pi Zero would have to be wireless I guess it doesn't have an Ethernet interface from what I was thinking of. But a standard Pi, for example. Um, I could use an Ethernet interface. Even power over Ethernet. And uh, it wouldn't be that large, really. Um, so that could be a good replacement if this is going to continue to be a problem. I was thinking of um, putting one of those together anyway, just from the point of view of having an extra camera have a different view or a, um, a camera which I can just pick up and hold uh, to show you something about what it is whatever I'm doing in a different way perhaps give a little bit more of a dynamic video performance um, it looks like his neck's cut off Yeah, let's colour that in. That's not the right colour. Um, and actually, as, as the camera, the I do actually have a camera module for the Raspberry Pi, but it's an OIR one. So that means it's got no infrared, no infrared filter on it. Which to some extent may or may not make much difference, except things like this, you may actually see the glow of the, the, uh, the pen. And it will misrepresent that glow because it's in the infrared being heat. But that might be a fun thing. Um, but at least it will give me a chance to actually try out that camera, given that I've got the module in the first place. I'm sure I've got a Raspberry Pi around here somewhere. I've got a host server that I can... The way in which I, you do it, or it can be done, is you actually uh, broadcast from the Raspberry Pi. So you set and uh, off a broadcast stream, not to Twitch, but um, in this particular case, I, I broadcast stream to my own broadcast server. So I do what Twitch is doing, which is here I am broadcasting to a Twitch server. Then any number of people connect, I'm being a bit simplistic here, but any number of people connect to that Twitch server to watch the stream. Um, I can do the same thing locally here on uh, run up a virtual server um, and uh, then have the camera broadcast to that and then I can get OBS to pick up a stream from that broadcast server and then um, as a replacement perhaps for this main camera or as an additional camera. So I've got an additional audio, uh, video source. Uh, and if that works successfully, I can have two or three of them and switch between them, either using my nice um, uh, toy here, or I could actually set up some foot switches, which would be an interesting uh, possibility. Uh, I've been thinking about that for a while, and I actually noticed that um, Puck Ranger 69 who does um, glass blowing, flame work, actually has a similar setup, I understand. 
changing uh, camera views with his feet. I believe he used, or used to use just a standard keyboard though, which has been sort of slightly modified um, on the floor for him to uh, tap with his feet. I would actually probably use real real switches. <laughs> Keyboards have real switches, but I was thinking of uh, proper foot switches. The sort of thing that you might get for guitar effects, pedals, that sort of thing. So they will stand up to the abuse, so are large enough to hit quite easily. Uh, and uh, will do the job. Uh, you bolt them down to a board so they don't go wandering around. And then uh, use me like an Arduino just as a um, you know, pretend to be a keyboard basically. That's one way of doing it. Or I could link it to the remote control. I have for OBS I've got two remote controls installed. One's a stream deck, another one is a web server type remote control. So I could actually um, have the Arduino actually linked to that remote, which may actually be better than trying to simulate a key sequence, for example, which is the the other way of doing it. Because that way, hotkeys, hotkeys have a habit of working in differently in different programs. So some programs, if they're running, will snatch some of the hotkeys. Um, and you have conflicts and all sorts of problems then. If I link it directly to the web server, a remote control, then I wouldn't have that problem. I've got a, it's a green line just there. That will not take colour. So it's standing out a bit white. Trying to colour it in a bit, but it's getting too dark. Um, so. I was just filling in a white area around there. It's a bit too, too white, and it should actually be darker anyway because, of course, shadow. And this is colour. And the colour's darker than that, so we will add some more colour into the colour. Right, so Whilst I'm doing this, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, pyrography and about the um, equipment that we're using here and pyrography itself. Pyrography is creating an image, shall we say, or creating uh, yeah, an image. That image could be text, but creating something. Uh, with a hot instrument. Uh, so it's a, I describe it sometimes as painting with heat, but it is uh, definitely creating or uh, creating something on a material or with heat. Uh, and in fact, it's got uh, Greek roots, pyro meaning uh, fire, and graphy, strictly speaking, uh, is writing, fire writing. Um, which incidentally one of the tools you can get is called a fire writer probably from the that base name but uh, graphy also can mean pictures so of images so uh, the, you know you can uh, you can reasonably equally apply it to both it's a, a very old or certainly is an old art form and it uh, used to be certainly used to be practiced on things like the old sailing ships 
where it would be done with a little spirit burner and a cell maker's needle. You can apply pyrography to just about any natural substance. Uh, probably to some unnatural ones as well, man-made ones as well, but they would have different effects and different ways in which you, the image is formed. On natural products, um, it is a cooking type of process that goes on. So if you've ever cooked meat, for example, as you apply the heat, let's say in a frying pan or under a grill, as it gets hot, the meat turns brown. One of the reasons for that is you're cooking the meat. And that is a little bit of what's occurring here with pyrography. You're cooking the cells and doing so uh, causes the brown to appear. Incidentally, maple syrup, for example, which is sap of tree, uh, is a relatively clear um, liquid, which when you heat it and, and start to create the maple syrup uh, itself, goes a golden brown colour from cooking. Same sort of idea. Um, in this particular case I'm using wood. I'm using a uh, plywood in this particular case but it's birch faced plywood. The birch being the important, well they're both bits important, but the birch being the important bit from the image perspective because it's a really whitish sort of wood one of the lighter ones which means I've got a greater tunnel range mahogany for example which is a dark wood you wouldn't see this light of pyrography on it at all you'd have to get really dark pyrography in this sort of order in order to see that on pyro on uh, um, mahogany or ebony which is almost black it would be almost impossible to apply pyrography to in the uh, in the sense of colouring in an area. So lighter woods work a lot better for images, although you know, a nice uh, darker sort of wood can give you a different feel to the image and, and save you having to apply pyrography to the background for example. So there are you know times when uh, you choose your wood according to the, uh, the uh, cost, the image that you're doing. One of the things you're looking for is potentially is clear wood, wood that doesn't have knots in it for example, this one up here does, but it's out of the way, it's not in the image itself. Knots uh, together with the grain of the wood itself can be a problem because the grain of the wood which is the lines and the, play, and the wood between those lines sometimes takes up the heat differently and the, indeed there's, you might be able to see there's a line here. Um, which looks lighter and that is actually the grain of the wood and it is because it's slightly harder than the wood in between and it's not taking up the colour as easily as the softer wood. Birch plywood usually is reasonably consistent across its surface um, but occasionally you do get these grain lines. Harder woods like pine or different woods like pine for example there's a distinct difference between the two and, and it's really hard to apply pyrography without getting grain lines on pine. It can be done but you have to take great care of it. Um, and the other, re the other thing here is plywood and that is used because in a thin sheet like this which is great if you want to frame it for example then the makeup of the plywood stabilizes the wood Applying pyrography to the top surface of a solid piece of birch this size would have it bending considerably uh, because as you apply the heat, as you're cooking the surface of the wood, you cause it to shrink and that shrink pulls the wood up. So birch and plywood, plywood's very good for that. Otherwise you have to use a fairly thick piece of wood to stop the, um, the warping effect which in itself is okay, it's great for plaques and things like that, so you can use thicker wood. Excuse me a second while I take a drink. Now there are all sorts of tools that you can use to apply pyrography. 
Um, this is uh, what this that I'm using here is one one type, shall we say? It, it's a member of one type, and this is an electrically heated tool where the electricity is actually passing through the tip of the tool, and that's where the heat is being generated because the tip has a resistance to it. And when you pass electricity through a resistance, it gets hot. In this case, hot enough to cook wood. Now, so I am just there's a uh, and there are variations. Different manufacturers have different ways in which these tools, generally speaking, connect to the base control unit, which is sat over there to one side. This actually is called a razor tip. Um, I like it because I can easily connect two tools to it, but um, that was, and these tools are easily interchangeable. I don't like the connectors, but can't have everything. The, the electricity, whilst they plug into the mains, this is running, um, I think it's about two and a half to three volts. So less than a couple of, or is it one and a half? The range anyway on these tools from about one and a half to about three, four volts. That in itself is about the same as sort of two or three. Well, anywhere from one to about three AAA cells, AA cells, just your standard uh, batteries, uh, single use batteries. And uh, the control unit is reducing the mains down to that sort of level. So this is in itself safe to touch. Uh, from the point of view of electricity, I'm not going to touch it because it's at several hundred degrees. Um, so I wouldn't get an electric shock from it, but I would burn myself. So I'm not going to touch it. But I have done it. If I were to have, you know, uh, and I turn the heat down, I guess. But um, if uh, I suppose the way I can prove it is that's the contacts, and I can touch that quite easily. Um, so a low voltage, I don't have a problem with that at all. Now then, although you do still have to be careful not to short them out because it produces heat because that's what that is, a short circuit. And this is feeling a bit loose, so I will have to adjust that a little bit later on. Because uh, this is one reason I don't like these connectors. They are not really designed for the amount of electrical current that passes down here, they're audio connectors. And they do get a little bit loose sometimes and when they're a little bit loose the resistance goes up resistance plus the electricity equals heat that connector gets hot and when that gets hot that gets less hot <laughs> and the idea is for that to be hot um, so Uh, but uh, others uh, fixed, you know, use fixed wiring on the pens, so you have to change the wire. When you want to change the pen, you have to change the wire. Yeah, it's a different way of doing it. Neither is particularly bad or good. They have their pros and cons. I mean, the, the pro of a fixed wire is it's fixed. The con is if you damage the wire, you either have, well, potentially have to get a new pen or you have to um, at least do some extensive soldering on the pen. This I just replay, either buy a new wire or I can, this is just a standard audio connector. I can go out and buy some wire and a connector if I want and solder them together for myself. So pros and cons. This is particularly flexible wire, which is also a very good idea when you're using these uh, devices. And um, my spare pens, of course, don't take up as much room because they don't have a wire hung off the back of them, and indeed they actually go in nice containers, uh, which keep them undamaged and well, clean. Yes, is probably important as well because if you get hair on this pen, you know about it when it heats up. There's another type of um, tool also electrically heated but resembles more of a soldering iron in that it's got a long silver barrel where the heat heater is 
and uh, then there's a, a tip on the end. That tip often is a, a well, a pointed tip or a chisel shaped tip. Sometimes you get actual shapes like a leaf or you know, so you're almost branding things. I personally would find those, I've not used one, the stress I've not used one, but I have used soldering irons, not for pyrography, but for soldering. And you get used to it, I think. Um, it's, but it is kind of like drawing, and this is an eraser, but it's sort of, you know, when you draw, you tend to hold your pen like this with those types of pyrography um, pen. It's like holding it back here and trying to draw. I personally feel that's quite difficult to do, but that's for me. And yet I can manipulate a soldering iron with a fine tip onto a very tiny point on the soldering on a circuit board. So I'm possibly over exaggerating my difficulty. I don't know. So those are the two main types of pyrographic machine. You can, of course, use blow torches and things like that. Oxyacetylene torches, you wouldn't be doing it on something like this. You'd be doing it on something bigger, probably. And you probably have a fire extinguisher handy and things like that. But it's possible to do. Actually, I was also thinking you can do it with what might be described as remotely heated devices, which, of course, is the cell maker's needle and the spirit burner. But any source of heat and something which will hold that heat without um, melting, maybe, uh, and then can be applied to wood, you know, the cell maker's needle, any piece of metal uh, like that, or even um, you did get soldering irons at one point that uh, you heated in a flame and then used, they had no self-heating, those sorts of things would do it quite as well as well would work as well uh, and it's just what you like and what control you've got over it and then you've got different styles of pyrography just like you've got different styles of art really None is particularly better than another, they're just different. So this is a photorealistic style. Now, despite calling it photorealistic style, it doesn't necessarily mean that it resembles a, a photograph and it looks like a photograph. But the, uh, if you look at a photograph, for example, you don't see a black line around the outside when you look at me on screen. You don't see a black line around me. You might see a green one if I'm against a chroma key screen, but <laughs> I'm not. So, um, but yeah, you, know, you don't generally see an outline around things in real life or with a photograph. So, and that's how this has been uh, presented is as an image without a border and a black line around it. There are there is a style where there would be a black line around things that is a drawn image which is then coloured in and then there is the sort of art which is essentially black and white or really dark and white um, which is a stenciled sort of image. So instead of drawing it freehand or more well, freehand with a pen of some kind, you would use the the branding iron approach, which is I want a leaf there, I want a leaf there, I want a diamond in the middle, I want to so, see how you can still get natural images because if you were doing a plant for example, then you'd want leaves. So you can still use those and uh, to some extent those also, you know, if you turn it sideways for example and you use the side of a leaf, you've got a line. So it's not exactly stamping but it tends to be just black and white shall we say. And uh, so that's the, the third style of pyrography. Often, well to some extent, pyrographic writing is of course that black and white 
and I do indeed have a writing tip here that I can do that with create lines and I've got one around here somewhere the Triforce from Zelda uh, which is on a, a box which is a black and white stone uh, so that's a geometric pattern in that particular case and that is one thing that they tend to get used for is that black and white style these things like geometric patterns um, Mandela type things uh, anything painting guards which use uh, just patterns or yeah patterns shapes um, as an example mention gods that's another material that you can apply pyrography to quite successfully as well it's a natural material of course it's a plant-based material which of course is what a tree is plant-based material you can do it to animal based materials as well like leather Although once you start in animal based materials, um, you don't necessarily get a pleasant working environment. Doing this on leather, for example, is not a particularly pleasant smell. Um, that is because it's leather uh, for, to start with. And the second one is leather is usually tanned. And when you start applying heat to tanned leather, the tanning solution is affected by the heat and it's not a pleasant smell. But I can apply pyrography to paper, for example, it, which is can be quite challenging because paper changes colour really quickly. And this is, by the way, paper. This is like a tissue paper. I'm just cleaning the base of the pen because I heard it scratching. Um, but as you can see, I can char. Well, I can I can make the the paper go brown. It doesn't set on fire immediately. In fact, it won't set on fire. This pen isn't hot enough for it to set on fire. But I can char all the way through the paper uh, to come out of the bottom. As you can see, I can create shades on here. And if I do it on actual white paper, I can create more shades. Although white, uh, the sort of photocopy paper goes very quickly from white to dark brown. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, if you do it on thicker card, that takes longer to heat, and therefore you have more range of color available to, for you. Oh, it's easier to create a range of color. So that's a um, you know you can you can do it on card and paper and papyrus and reed based papers and things like that you can do it you can actually do it on eggshells as an example gods i already mentioned um, technically it can be done on ivory but there again that's a prohibited substance these days so what you technically can do and what you can actually do are two entirely different things it can be done on bone Again, that's not a very pleasant smell if you uh, were to try that, but it is uh, it is possible to do. And actually, you get some you can get some quite nice pyrography because you're going white and bone. Obviously, uh, bleach bone especially is really white, and it goes really dark when it's uh, if you apply pyrography to a reasonable amount. So you can get really sort of black and white uh, images. But so uh, things like uh, wood and wood and leather tend to, uh, wood leather and gourd tend to be the more common materials used for pyrography. I'm messing around here that area which I'm busy leaving white doesn't want to be white's too bright so let's turn it down and then we'll see about what color I actually want it it's quite a light fur band 
and it's also reflecting light and everything else. This is scratching against something. Now just in case tooling marks start to show, keeping the pen direction consistent with the fur direction at that point. So any tooling marks are consistent with the fur patterning. Right, what I also want to do here is just edge the side of the muzzle a little bit better. Probably we'll do this with more uh, a change of, sorry, a darker colour ultimately. I'm trying to do this without creating an actual dark edge. Or dark, yeah, um, well, a, a, a dark line. I don't want a dark line to show. Because as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're not outlining things here. You see, you see things in a photograph because the contrast or the colour between two things is different, and therefore you see the edge. It goes more up around there. We'll fix that later. Uh, I've pulled that in a bit too far, really. Um, the, the muzzle sort of comes around there to around this edge here, so to, to catch with the corner of the eye socket. That's only a matter of darkening this down because that's marking, fur marking, is that so? And here it's around there. And again, that's uh, shadow and fur marking a little bit around there because the, the angle changes. So this is darker than that because the angle where the lights appear, this the edge of his muzzle here is in uh, shadow more so than this side of his face. Excuse me for a second while well, I have a drink. Right, so we're getting some shape in the face now. So what I'm going to start and do is, ooh, do some work around here and across the top there maybe that marking that fur marking for them which is like a broad stripe looks a little bit odd it's not, it does that, but it looks odd when I'm looking at it here in this sort of view. Yeah. 
And I wonder whether to do anything about that now. I want to leave it till a bit later on. Um, I think I just made the decision. <laughs> I just want to curve that a little bit. Now a little bit around here was... I seem to have fallen back on creating a texture, which is not something I wanted to do. So what I'm just going to do is do some work around here just to remove the texture, or remove some of the texturing. So if, if you're looking at it, hopefully you can see it, it looks it looks a little bit like lots of fine hairs or, or quick strokes with a pen. I want it to be more of a solid colour. I want it to avoid using hair-like structures. Now, I've done that already with two pussy cats, with the uh, image of Felix and the image of Junior. And it works really well. I'm not sure the ginger one works as well, but I don't want to play with that for the moment. I'm trying to this to do it using a more solid colour. When I say more solid colour, I'm not actually trying to go really almost cartoon style, you know, solid colour everywhere. But I am trying to do it using a more uh, more uniform colouring in the areas of uh, where I want the darker shades. So I can get rid of some of the um, some of the lines by just reapplying pyrography over the top. Ideally coming in between the lines Because if you apply pyrography over the top of an area that's already got pyrography applied Everything goes down You know you 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 put a color over Something white and a color over something darker So that you, you start with a contrast between them and as you apply the same color which is transparent over the top of both of them they both sort of reduce in brightness and they still keep the contrast between them but at a lower intensity and if you want to try and get rid of the uh, difference in contrast you've got to sort of bring this this one down or this one darker to match that and that's the bit in between the, this is the lines this is a bit in between the lines so you've got to kind of fill in between the lines <laughs> which can be challenging go away that's a uh, a pop-up on the screen there now, it's, I'm not going to be able to go between all of the lines here, but I am going to try and at least fill in some of it. I don't know what possessed me to do this, because ever since I started this image, the, the idea was to use sort of large uniform blocks of colour. Now, I suspect I was partly doing it because I want a fluffy edge. Equally, the fact that I'm not outlining anything means I don't want a solid line at the edge of it either. I mean, this is fur. Um, any sort of pattern on the fur is a real soft edge pattern. Even in the direction of the fur, it's, it's a fuzzy edge. And I'm going to try and keep that if I can. I'm not really looking to do it, as I say, um, in an outline style. But that applies equally when you're actually applying the pyrography. If I do a number of lines side by side and start and stop at the same place each time, then I do effectively create that hard edge.
Okay, I've got a, a grain line there, which is going to interfere a little bit. We're now progressing to the point of the image where we actually start at not only applying details but sort of, you know, well we're still applying some blocks of colour but starting to actually apply more of the face shape now. So the face will start to come more alive and start to stand out a little bit more. It still looks white on camera. Doesn't quite look it here but it does on camera. Now I'm going to start to bring this across the top here because it doesn't stop there, it actually goes across. So in principle using a wide shader like this helps to create uniform blocks of colour. In practice that depends on how you use the tool. I can use it in ways that um, create lines more than uh, than get rid of them. If I tip it up on its tip, for example, I'll create really sharp uh, lines. Yeah, I'm trying to create somewhat of a diffuse colour. As I mentioned, it's a soft edge. And actually I can't use this tool completely flat. I'm using it tipped on its edge slightly but using it like an edge of your hand across like that rather than doing that. Um, I, don't, I don't get an even heat across the, uh, the foot of this. And if I put the whole thing down really flat then I get inconsistent heating and I don't get the sort of marking or the, the, uh, the marking that I will, I'm looking for when I do that. So I'm using it very slightly tipped on its left edge. So there's a bit more pressure applied to the left edge and that kind of smooths things out as I move the pen across left to right. One of the things you rarely do with pyrography is scrub backwards and forwards like you would with a pencil. It does not produce the same effect as a pencil would. And you do get other start and stop effects when that happens. As well because to scrub it backwards and forwards you have to stop at the end of each line. You stop moving, your pen is in a place for longer than it would be if it was moving and that applies more heat so you get a dark dark end uh, a light band and a dark start when you do that so you tend to sort of it's as though you've drawn two lines and coloured in between them now that's an extreme uh, with particularly with pyrography but it is it is uh, something that still does and can happen Depending on the temperature of your tool as well. If your tool is turned down in temperature, it's less likely to do that sort of thing. I'm going to start by reinforcing this brown here and taking away some of those tooling marks if I can. So by reinforcing what I'm meaning is um, filling in some of the gaps and also actually making it slightly darker. Pyrography is actually more about contrast than it is about absolute value. So artist wise when you talk about contrast where about uh, value you're talking about um, lightness and darkness. 
And what looks white to you on a power graphic image it really depends on the contrast to the things around it. And it can be quite dark, relatively speaking. But if the stuff around it is darker still, then the bit that is in the middle can look white even though it's nowhere near. So it is often about uh, the contrast between things or the difference between the, uh, the values that dictate what it looks like the, rather than the absolute value itself. Which is why if I make this too dark, for example, for what I'm, the, effect, the effect I'm after, then by darkening the things around it, I don't end up having to try and erase it. Um, I, by virtue of increasing the contrast to something that's next to it, I make the bit that's too dark look lighter. So that's one of the tricks of fixing mistakes. And it's actually one of the better ways of fixing mistakes rather than trying to erase them. A bit like having a tattoo, if you want to erase a tattoo, usually the way it's done is by, or often the way it's done is by disguising it as another tattoo, changing it by tattooing around it or over the top of it. Of course there is laser tattoo removal, but that's a different thing altogether. And actually it's a similar sort of thing in that um, the effect of that often is uh, your skin then has to recover. And, may, and if you were to try and apply a tattoo to that area, it wouldn't apply in the same way as it did to other skin. And it's an interesting thing. And just pyrography is actually the same. If I try and erase this by, say, sandpapering the wood, which would remove some of the brown, and then put pyrography over the top, the sandpapered area stands out, looks different. And the surface texture is different, it changes. And uh, it becomes quite obvious what you've done. So I tend not to use things like scraping techniques to try and... Hello pussycat! Oh, that was a Felix. So you can't see Felix, I'm not going to attempt to pick him up because he doesn't like it. You'd probably hear him complain about it if I did, but he'd, uh, he'd get upset. That's not, uh, not something I want to do just to pick him up. He's actually a cat that doesn't like being picked up. Actually doesn't like being restricted in any way. If he thinks that you are restricting him, he complains. You don't actually even have to physically hold him with such a can just put like a hand on his chest and he thinks he's being restricted and he'll complain about it. Even though he could get away if he wanted. Well, Felix is getting to be quite an old man these days. I don't actually know how old he is, but this looks like he's. <laughs> Looking at that there, it kind of. I'm trying to think what sort of. It looks a bit like a particular short haircut style. I'm trying to think what it looks like, but. Hmm. Yeah, well, carry on. <laughs> Actually, I'm getting tired. I can tell that because I've gone quiet. So 
seems to have been a, a relatively busy day to me. I've been, again, I've mentioned it before, but I've been decorating all day. So I've been stripping wallpaper. And uh, filling in plaster on walls where there's gouges and things like that as a result of the stripping. It looks like a really short haircut. I've got to do some more colouring around here to get rid of that look. But we'll work on that. But I'm not going to work on it now. As I mentioned just then, I think I'm getting a bit too tired. And tired makes mistakes. And I've just mentioned how difficult make, uh, fixing mistakes can be. So that's what we've got. Turn it that way so it's in line with the camera. That's the image we've got as it stands at the moment. We've put a base colouring on most of the face, which is starting to help um, with the before a lot of large area of that was was the base white colour and that completely throws out the image in terms of three-dimensional shaping and placement. Now that we've um, filled in a colour, a base colour, we've taken off that bright white. It still isn't bright, but you are now less looking at uh, something having been the wrong shape now is kind of just a little bit unusual like this uh, whilst this looks like he's wearing a cap equally it could be a, like a, a shadow of the top of the head there and or, or a bright light on this part of the face perhaps it doesn't look as um, out of shape as it did previously and things like this area here of the muzzle and uh, now uh, whilst it still looks like it's sort of been painted white a little bit um, I'm, looking, I'm looking at the broadcast image that you're seeing so like there's a bright light on it for example so it's still too light but at least now this is popping out of the screen at you uh, and the, the eyes and the forehead is starting to recede back and the top of the head is going further back still. So we're now getting levels built up in the face, which is starting to uh, define the shape more. And the eyes now are looking a lot better than they did before because of the, the placement is now more natural because of the darker areas around it. So next stream, which is probably going to be next weekend, we'll be just carrying on with uh, with the shading and the colouring, making the shading as we come around here darker, um, adding some more darkness across here just to get rid of that crew cut look that's there. So it starts to look like the fur goes all the way through over the top here. Shadow shading down here. There is a bit more to do down on the body there and down here, but we'll deal with that later. And of course, that's the years. So what I'm going to do is get you more used to believing these buttons when they do things. I don't keep looking at the, at the video screens. But what I want to say is thank you very much for watching, if you have been. If you haven't, then there's no point in me saying that to you because you're not listening. <laughs> But if you've just joined, I'm sorry, I'm about to close the stream for tonight. As I mentioned, I would hope to be streaming again next weekend, Saturday uh, and or Sunday, or not sure. Uh, try and do one night, possibly both if I can. Stream times usually from about 8pm, 7, 7.30 to 8pm it usually works out at, for about a couple of hours, till around about now, 10 o'clock. UK time. If you like and you're not already following please do so you'll get the notifications out of Twitch when it's working and if you'd like to follow me on Twitter it's at Zaragonart. I also tweet when I go live and uh, a small number of other tweets usually related to something to do with the art materials or the studio itself. So Thank you again, as I mentioned, for watching. Hope to see you on the next stream and bye for now.